Greetings and Namaskara, everyone. This Himalayan Academy Publications presentation is by Sakguru Bodhinatha Valen Swami and is entitled The Nature and Worship of Lord Murugan. Lord Murugan is referred to by many different names. Some of the most frequently used are Kartikeya, Kumara, Skanda. Shanmukhanada, Arumugam, Parlani, and Subramanya. Though some Hindus consider him to be the Supreme Being, which is the viewpoint of the denomination called Kaumaram, most consider him to be part of Saivism. In Saivism, he is the younger son of Lord Shiva, born of Shiva's divine mind. The older son, of course, is Lord Ganesha. Murugan's Vahana vehicle is a peacock, Mayil, and he carries a spear called a veil, which represents the power to overcome darkness and ignorance. Though recognized across the subcontinent, Murugan is a particular favorite among the Tamil people, and his history in Tamil literature dates back to the Sangam period, 1st to 4th century CE. In fact, he is considered to be a Tamil Kadaval, Lord of Tamil, and is said to have taught the Tamil language to sage Augustia. In addition to Sangam literature, several tales of Murugan may also be found in various Puranas. He has two consorts, Devayanai and Vali. Devayana is the daughter of Indra, and Vali is the adopted daughter of a hunter chieftain. Some temples have all three in a one sanctum, which is named Vali Devayanai Sameta Subramanya. Hinduism is not the only religion in which Lord Murugan is found. As would seem quite natural, he is also found in the Buddhist religion. This is a Japanese image of the six-faced deity, which has the familiar peacock but distinctive Japanese facial features. As would be expected, Lord Murugan's brother, Lord Ganesha, also made the journey to Japan, where he is known as Kangitan. In Shingon Buddhism, Murugan is called Skanda, Aidaten, and Kumaraten. In Mahayana Buddhism, he is called Skanda and Wei Tu. Skanda's function is to protect the monasteries, the monks, and the religion's teachings. In Chinese temples, Skanda faces the statue of the Buddha in the main shrine. The legend of Lord Murugan's birth is intimately connected to the protection of Indra and the other devas from the clutches of the Asura Surapadma. When the devas requested Shiva to redeem them from the Asura, it is said that six sparks came out of the powerful third eye of Shiva, who gave the sparks to Vayu, who in turn handed them over to Agni. Then Agni left the sparks in the Ganga, which brought the sparks to the holy Saravana Poikai. The six sparks became six children and were brought up by the six Kartikai Pendir, celestial virgins. Parvati came there and united all six into one with six faces, twelve hands and twelve eyes in one body called Shanmuka, Sanskrit, or Aramugam, Tamil. The six babes that were lying on the lotuses in the Saravana pond were nursed by the devis of the constellation Kritika, also called Kartikai, and known in English as the Pleiades. Hence Skanda came to be known by the name of Kartikeya, meaning child of the Pleiades. There were three main annual festivals to Lord Murugan, Taipusam, Vaikasi Vasakam, and Skanda Shashti. Taipusam occurs on the Pushya Nakshatra in January-February. During this festival, we fast and perform public penance called Kavadi, seeking Murugan's blessings to dispel our selfishness, pride, and vanity. 
The Sanskrit word for penance is prayaschitta and refers to an act of devotion, austerity, or discipline undertaken to soften or nullify the anticipated reaction of a past action. Penance is uncomfortable karma inflicted upon oneself. To mitigate one's karmic burden caused by wrongful actions. It is consciously relieving the karmic burden of wrongful actions by undergoing physical or mental hardships and challenges. A penance offered to Lord Murugan, especially during Thai Pusam, consists of carrying in procession a heavy, beautifully decorated short wooden pole surmounted by a wooden arch from which pots of milk hang which are to be used for his abhisheka. The participant's tongue and other parts of the body are often pierced with small silver spears or hooks. Satguru Bodhinath of Swami cautions, carrying kavadi and other forms of penance should never be done for the purpose of impressing others. Rather, it should be done having in mind specific misdeeds you are atoning for, as well as promising Lord Murugan not to repeat them again. And Sakguru Savaya Subramunya Swami has this insight into the inner process of penance. Darshan coming from the great temples of our gods can change the patterns of karma dating back many past lives. Clearing and clarifying conditions that were created hundreds of years ago and are but seeds now waiting to manifest in the future. Through the grace of gods, those seeds can be removed if the manifestation in the future would not enhance the evolution of the soul. He also has this statement that relates specifically to Lord Murugan. When we perform penance and beseech his blessings, this merciful God hurls his veil into the astral plane. Piercing discordant sounds, colors, and shapes removing the mind's darkness. The second annual festival is Vaikasi Visakam, held on Lord Kartikeya's birth star, Vishaka Nakshatra, in May-June. Elaborate Abhisheka is conducted in all his temples. It is a time of gift-giving to pundits and great souls, weddings, feedings for the poor, caring for trees, spiritual initiation, diksha, and conclaves of holy men. The third annual festival is Skanda Shashti, which is celebrated on the six days after the new moon in October-November with festive processions and pujas invoking his protection and grace. It honors Murugans receiving the veil. His lance of spiritual illumination, Yana Shakti, and culminates in a dramatic victory celebration of spiritual light over Asuric darkness, which tells the story of the legend of Lord Murugan defeating Sura Padma. The Asura Sura Padma had taken the devas captive. Lord Shiva asked Lord Murugan to destroy the Asuras and free the devas from their cruel bondage. Lord Murugan reached Tiruchandor with his huge army and encamped. He sent his lieutenant Virabahu to the Asuras as an emissary and asked Sura Padma to release the Devas. Since Sura Padma turned down the request, war was started. The intense battle continued for a few days. During the first five days of the war, the brothers of Sura Padma and all the other Asuras perished. On the sixth day in the battle between Lord Murugan and Sura Padma, Sura Padma became a gigantic mango tree which threatened to smother the world. Murgan cleft this tree with his veil, and Surapadma then took shape as a peacock and a rooster, both of which charged at Murgan. However, the deity tamed both with a single loving glance. To commemorate the defeat of the Asuras, Murgan ordered that the peacock and rooster should respectively become his mountain emblem of his standard. 
The Surapadma's gift of immortality by Shiva was recognized and he became, in the form of two birds, the transformed and submissive symbols of Murugan's dominance. A special aspect of Skanda Shashti is that some Murugan Bhaktars take a fasting vow for this festival as a way to intensify their worship. A typical vrata is to fast during the day, attend the temple festival ceremonies in the evening, and only afterwards have a meal. It is a natural time to beseech Lord Murugan to take away your pride and replace it with submission and humility, as he did for Surapadma. Some Murugan Bhaktars also observe a vrata on the monthly six titi. Turning to another aspect of Lord Skanda, Hindu icons in our temples all have mystical symbolism. A common symbolism is to depict the god as male and the god's energy or shakti as his spouse. God is everywhere seen as the beloved divine couple. Philosophically, however, the caution is always made that God and God's energy are one, and the metaphor of the inseparable divine couple serves only to illustrate this oneness. In the case of Lord Murugan, his consorts are Valli and Devayanai. Additionally, we have the veil as an important symbol. These three represent three distinct energies, powers, or shaktis. Valli represents Icha Shakti, the power of desire. Devayanai represents Kriya Shakti, the power of action. The veil represents Yana Shakti, the power of wisdom. Important insights into the soul's maturing process can be gained by looking at the three shaktis of Lord Skanda, the power of desire, the power of action, and the power of wisdom, which are also the three powers of the soul. We first have a desire, and when the desire becomes strong enough, we act. In young souls, the action may be ill-conceived, even against dharma. For example, a man wants a computer, so he steals one. Money is needed, so he robs a bank. The soul is often caught up in repeating a cycle of similar experiences, moving back and forth from desire to action, desire to action, until the needed lesson is learned. In the case of the adharmic action of stealing, Eventually, he will learn the lesson that this is not the best way to acquire possessions. This learning is the yana shakti, wisdom causing his behavior to improve. This process also works for dharmic actions as well. We are helping out as a volunteer at the temple and teaching children's classes once a month. We like the feeling it gives us of helping others in a meaningful way and decide to help out every week and even participate in the meetings which plan out the classes. We are doing a selfless action and the reaction it has on us is to feel more inner joy. Therefore, the yana is to decide to do even more of it and thus feel more joyful. We have again improved our behavior. We can see in both of these examples how it is that the soul undergoes experiences in the world with desire leading to action, which eventually leads to wisdom and improving of our behavior. This is the divine pattern through which our soul matures over many lifetimes, moving ever closer to God. Whether an action we have committed is dharmic or adharmic, the worship of Lord Skanda and the power of his veil, or Yana Shakti, can help us understand the wisdom or lack of wisdom of our actions more quickly. Savaya Subramunya Swami gave this description. Murugan's dynamic power awakens spiritual cognition to propel souls onward in their evolution to Shiva's feet. 
Another symbolism involves Lord Murugan's Vahana, the peacock. The peacock, Mayil in Tamo, symbolizes effulgent beauty and religion in full glory. Furthermore, the peacock is able to control powerful snakes such as the cobra, symbolizing the soulful domination of the instinctive elements or control of the kundalini, which is yoga. This is shown in some depictions by having the peacock hold down a large snake with one talon. For those who are fortunate enough to be practicing yoga under the direction of a living guru, Lord Murugan plays a unique role. Savaya Subramunya Swami explains, To attain even the permission to perform yoga, one must have the grace of Lord Ganesha and the grace of Lord Murugan. Lord Murugan is the god of the Kundalini. Of the advanced yogic practices, unfoldment all happens within the Kundalini and the chakras within our subtle bodies. Once a profound relationship is developed with Lord Murugan, then with the Guru's permission and guidance, true yoga may commence. Otherwise, no matter how long one sits in meditation, no matter how hard one tries, it is just sitting, it is just trying. There is no fire there, no shakti, no power, no change. It is the gods who control the fire. And at this stage, help the devotee immensely, bringing him closer and closer to the supreme god, Shiva. My last topic is about the personal experience of Lord Murugan and begins with the concept of faith. Faith is central to all the world's religions. Webster's Dictionary defines religious faith as unquestioning belief in God and religious tenets that does not require proof or evidence. The Hindu view of faith is somewhat different. It is more than hope more than belief. This is because in Hinduism, faith is not a static state. Rather, it is constantly deepening through personal experience and spiritual growth. The spiritual truths of Sanatana Dharma, initially accepted without proof, are ultimately proved through personal experience. My guru presents this deeper aspect of faith by citing an old saying favored by pragmatic intellectuals, seeing is believing, and then states that a more profound adage is, believing is seeing. He goes on to explain that today's scientists and educators often turn their perceptions off by seeing with their two eyes and passing judgments based on what they currently believe. The rishis of the past and the rishis of the now and those yet to come also are seers. Their seeing is not with the two eyes, it is with the third eye, the eye of the soul. He observed, the intellect in its capacity to contain truth is a very limited tool, while faith is a very broad, accommodating and embracing faculty. The mystery of life and beyond life of God is really better understood through faith than through intellectual reasoning. In this regard, many of the great saints and sages of Hinduism have had visions of Lord Murugan and shared them with their devotees, thus strengthening the devotees' faith and understanding of these divine beings. In ancient times, such great saints as Arunagiri Nadar had visions of Lord Murugan and wrote of his experiences in his devotional poems such as in Kandar Anubhuti. Swami Shivananda, Divine Life Society founder, wrote an excellent description of this work. The term Kandar Anubhuti is derived from Kandar and Anubhuti. Kandar in Tamil is Skanda in Sanskrit. Anubhuti means becoming one with or experience. Hence, Kandar Anubhuti means to become one with Skanda and denotes God experience. 
This is a work sung by St. Arunagiri Nadar as a result of his God experience, or Kandar Anubhuti, which also directs others to that experience. It is the experience of the saint given expression to in such powerful words that when it is repeated by others, it is capable of bringing the same experience in them in due course. Such is the glory of the work. A sample verse reads, Lord Murugan, wielder of the veil, whose form shines like the crimson sky, on that day you revealed to me the unique divine experience. Having it and experiencing it is the only way to understand it. It is something to talk about. How can it be told to someone else? In modern times, Gurudeva has shared some of his mystical perspectives and experiences of Lord Murugan in his writings and stories. One story has to do with the founding of our Kaudavul Temple in Hawaii in 1973. A large Nataraja bronze had recently arrived from India, and Gurudeva was wondering where in the building to place it. That night in a vision, Lord Murugan came and struck his veil three times on the spot where the deity Nataraja was to be placed. We placed the Nataraja there the next day, and worship began. For those who haven't seen our Kaudavul temple, here is a photograph of the outside. This is a photograph of the Murugan Murti during the Tai Pusam 2019 celebration. The Abhishekam is lengthy and this photograph is of showing the flame after the pouring of yogurt. We have arranged group pilgrimages to India and Sri Lanka since 1969 and some pilgrims on various programs had life-changing visions of Lord Murugan as well as other deities. Such visions born of the intensity of pilgrimage and inner striving would often come in the form of the stone or bronze murti moving and smiling at them, or turning into an animated human-like figure. Some devotees with their eyes closed inwardly saw the deity's face, as real as any living being. Though occasionally a devotee may have a vision of the deity, the more common way we experience him is as uplifting peaceful and divine energy or shakti that radiates out from the image. These blessings of the deity are called sanidya and refer to the radiance and blessed presence of shakti in and around the temple. In some of Gurudeva's writings, he also refers to these blessings as the darshan of the deity. It is easiest to feel these blessings at the high point of the puja when the flame is held high and the bells ring the loudest. This is because during the culminating arati, the deity and his helpers or devas reflect back the prana they have received through offerings into the aura of each devotee, purifying it of subconscious conditions. The devotee so blessed leaves feeling uplifted and relieved of mental burdens. Here is an analogy with experiencing the sun. If we go outside on a sunny day and close our eyes, we can feel the sun's rays on our skin without seeing the sun in the sky, and in that way, experience the sun. This is similar to what happens in the temple. Our inner or spiritual eye, the third eye, is not open, so we don't see the deity. However, we can feel in our nervous system the spiritual energy that radiates out from the murti and in that way experience the deity. When in this way Lord Murugan's blessings come into our life, we become a better person, more kind, disciplined, and spiritual. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti